morning, everybody that's joined our service on YouTube. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you today for your blessings upon us and all that you do and give to us, Lord. We pray for your spirit to rest upon us today and guide us in our service. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, I've entitled our message, It's Not About Me. And I've taken this from, well, from a few reflections on my own and also 2 Corinthians chapter 4, which says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Any, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ our Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. For we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life, is at work in you. We are living in a world where this sense of entitlement is the flare of the day. It seems that determination and motivation have fallen to the wayside, and if you can skip the line or find a simpler way, you can basically get everything you want. Instead of worshiping God in spirit and in truth, perhaps sometimes we are making idols of ourselves. We sometimes do what it takes to get what we want. I love to watch interviews and listen to podcasts and read articles on so many different societal issues that are facing us today. And this is one of them. And where have we gone? And how far have we gone? Have we gone too far? So in my reading, I was reading through some articles and I found this. And it says that the sense of entitlement in society today can stem from a variety of factors, including cultural influences, the way we've been brought up, and societal norms. In some cases, individuals may feel entitled due to a sense of privilege, power, while in other cases it may arise from a lack of understanding or a lack of empathy for other people. And then some researchers suggest that the rise of an individualism in modern society where personal fulfillment and achievement are highly valued. And this may contribute to feelings of entitlement. Additionally, the influence of media, the advertising that we see today can also play a role in shaping people's expectations and desires. It's important to note that entitlement is a complex and it's a multifaceted issue. And its roots can vary widely from person to person. Understanding and addressing this phenomena often requires a nuanced approach that takes into account individual experiences, societal structures, and cultural influences. And I thought about that, and I thought, how sad this is. And it's sad to see that in this age of technology, an entitlement where people are afraid to speak the truth, the truth will still shine forth and shine through. 
even through people and situations that you think might be the opposite. I know you're going to laugh, but one of my favorite people to listen to is Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was once the governor of California. I like the man. I thought, too bad he couldn't come in to become president. But because he was born in Austria, you'd have to be born in the U.S. But he makes a whole lot of sense. So I say to myself, take this American actor, this businessman, this filmmaker, former politician, former professional bodybuilder Arnold Schwarzenegger, known for his roles in his high-profile action movies, and I love to listen to him. I listened to him one day discuss his take on today's society, and it wasn't pleasant. He's written a book called Be Useful, Seven Tools for Life, and so he says this. Arnold says this. He says, the human mind can only grow through resistance. The more you struggle, the further you're going to go and the stronger you're going to get. And then he continues, that's just the way the world works. Anyone who tries to baby themselves and pamper themselves and try to protect themselves, and he says, I don't want to feel bad. I don't want to go through all of this discomfort. Everything is over with, he says. You're never going to get there. You have to learn to accept the pain and the misery and the discomfort, all of the things that we don't like, he says, because the more you experience these things that you really don't like, the more you're going to grow and the tougher you're going to get and the more you're going to be able to handle things. He says so many young kids today are kind of shying away from that. And then he has some insightful thoughts on how society in the U.S. nation were built. He says, the U.S. was built by tough men and women that went out there at five in the morning, went out there and struggled and fought, and they worked hard. That's what made this country great. And I think we can say the same for Canada. He said, we need to continue this way. Don't start creating a generation of wimps and weak people where we're concerned about how are you feeling today? I don't want to hurt your feelings. It's nice to be considered. He said, yes, we have to be considerate. I totally agree with that, he added. But let's not over-baby the kids. Let's not over-baby people. Let's go and teach kids to be tough, to go out and do some sports, to go out and study, to struggle, to go through these kind of painful moments sometimes. And then I thought about this after I listened to this, and I thought, Wow, have we created a monster today? I'm happy to see that people are beginning to sit up and take notice because we have become a nation of it's all about me. Look at me. Look at my pretty selfie on Facebook today. Look at my wonderful meal I just cooked and I'm going to take 50,000 pictures of it and place it on Instagram. TikTok, and Facebook. But in reality, it's not about me. It isn't about us, especially if we call ourselves Christian. It's about Jesus. It's about sacrificing, sacrificing for others and for him. It's about following his example, his example of humility and sacrifice. And then I remembered 2 Corinthians chapter 4 which says, remember, our message is not about ourselves, for we're proclaiming Jesus Christ the Master. All we are is messengers, errand runners for Jesus and for you. It started when God said, light up the darkness, and our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. If you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this precious, precious, blah, precious message around in these unadored clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not much to look at. We've been surrounded and battered by troubles. We're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. 
We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't been broken. What they did to Jesus, they do to us. Trial and torture, mockery and murder. What Jesus did among them, he does in us. He lives. Our lives are at a constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. While we're going through the worst, you're getting in on the best. It's not about us. When we become Christians, it doesn't give us a license to suddenly be superior to others, so much that we may think that we've been endowed with something that makes us so much better than everyone who we think are on the outside. No. Remember that Jesus went and around and he taught among the sinners and the cast-offs of his time of society, the tax collectors, adulterers, thieves. He chose to use stories to teach lessons involving Samaritans who rescued a poor, beaten-up man who the Jews hated. He rescued an adulteress who became a disciple. He called fishermen and tax collectors, housewives, in every walk of life. Yet the Pharisees thought it was all about them. It isn't about us and them. It isn't about the big churches and the little churches. It's all about Jesus. Do we want to serve him or do we want to serve ourselves? William Barclay once said, Life is designed to keep us from pride. However great our Christian glory, we are still mortal people. We are still victims of circumstances, still subject to the chances and the changes of human life. We're still mortal bodies with all that body weaknesses and pain. We are like people with precious treasures contained in earthen vessels, which themselves are weak and worthless. We talk a great deal about the power of humanity and about the vast forces which we control, but the real characteristic of humanity is not our power, but our weaknesses. As Pascal said, a drop of water or even a breath of air can kill us. As Joan of Arc once said, when she was abandoned by those who should have stood by her, she says, it is better to be alone with God. His friendship will never fail me nor his counsel, nor in his love. In his strength, I will dare and dare and dare until I die. And we know what happened to her. When we have the mindset that we are here to serve God and not ourselves, the sense of entitlement begins to diminish, and we realize that we are fully dependent upon him. As the psalmist wrote in Psalm 27, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Nothing can alter the loyalty of God. We are often disloyal to God and each other, but God is always faithful. So how do we fend off this sense of entitlement when we think, man, I deserve a bigger home, a fancier car, a little bit more money, something bigger, better in life? I mean, it's easy to think that way. I, I sometimes, it's easy to think that way. I know that in my own grumblings in my mind, I too have often thought that way. But how do we come back to reality, back on track, and realize when our mindset is off God and on ourselves? I think the answer lies in the example of Jesus. He did not come as a king to rule over the world from an ivory palace, riding a white steed through the city with elaborate jewelry and robes, that probably would have cost more than anyone could have ever afforded. No, he chose humility. He chose the servant life all the way to the cross. Philippians 2 says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who be in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
And then further on in the chapter, he says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like the stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. We have the chance to shine like stars in the sky. Shine in a world that is dying. Shining in a world that is broken. A world that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus. The gospel of love and compassion that can change their lives for his glory. We have such an opportunity to shine for Jesus when we can move away from our own foibles and trappings and when we can shed the ideology that tradition and our own man-made rules and regulations overshadow the will of God and his glory. When we can overshadow and get over that, we can shine for Jesus. And then maybe we can show the masses that truth does reign in a world that chooses something fake. And I place myself in all of this, and I think, do I shine enough for Christ? Do I shine enough for Jesus? Do I hold on to my own ideals? Is there a power struggle between what the Spirit of Christ wants and what I want? The answer isn't always a nice pill to swallow. Sometimes we have to take that bitter medicine. And I remember when I was younger, and it was all about me. When do I get the big job? When will I get the big money so that I can buy the big truck that I want? And I soon discovered that it would take a lot of hard work, a lot of long hours, and a whole lot of bumps along the way. But life didn't always work out the way that I had planned, because it wasn't about me. I also discovered that when I got my eyes off Christ, that life could be a whole lot worse, and sometimes lonely, and even a little bit more bitter. Jesus never promised us that life would be easy. Absolutely not. He even didn't have a roof over his head most of the time or a place to lay his own head on a pillow. He was the poster child of homelessness. But he did promise that by placing everything on him, he would never leave us. And he would always teach us the way to live. The movie Back to the Future illustrates a sense of entitlement of the character of Biff Tannen. If you've ever watched the movie, one of my favorites when I was growing up. The entitled bullying nemesis of George McFly, who was a hero of the movie. And in one instance, after borrowing and wrecking George's car, Biff holds George responsible, and he blames George for not making him aware that the car had blind spots in it. Although a bit amusing, I think sometimes we can identify with Biff. And then uh, finally, the California Community Service representative, Ray Kim, says this from experience. Jesus teaches us that entitlement is the enemy of gratitude. Instead of being grateful, the entitled servant expects to be thanked and thinks that he or she is deserving a special praise just for doing their job. As long as our hearts are entitled, personal growth in our relationship with God and with others will cease. And entitlement undermines intimacy because we get angry with God and people around us when they don't give us what we want. In fact, the entitled life is one in which happiness is elusive and our heart remains dissatisfied and we feel all alone. So this reminds me that when feelings of entitlement want to creep in, when I think of myself over others, I need to be always in an attitude of prayer, saying, God, help me. Show me the better way. Change my heart and my mind and my spirit. Allow my spirit to always be in tune with your spirit so that I will want to place others before myself. Amen. And now let's finish with our closing hymn, Wonderful Words of Life. God bless you today and into.